colleagues, uh, friends, partners. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our session this morning um, on the subject of peace, climate action, and the nuclear disarmament, our intergenerational dialogue on uh, nuclear disarmament. Armed with the conflict, nuclear weapons, policies, and climate change pose existential threats to current and future generations. What policies at city and federal level can address these issues? This event brings together policymakers and religious and civil society leaders with the youth in an intergenerational format to share experience, innovation, and inspiration for a sustainable future. My name is Ilya Kursienka, and I am presenting also my colleague, my co-moderator, Vanda Proskova, and passing on the word of interest to you to first. Thank you, Ilya. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's also important to note that this event is in a hybrid format, which we're very proud of. They're strong technical skills. So we would also say, I'd like to say hi and hello and good morning, um, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, for those who watch online. Um, this event is live streamed on Zoom and also Facebook, so it'll be recorded. So if anyone's having so much fun and wants to rewatch, you'll have the option to do so. Um, I'll also remind to the participants that are online uh, that we are on Zoom that we have the Q and A function on. So if you have any questions for any of our panelists, you're more than welcome to put your questions into the Q and A box. If you have any um, just comments or information to share, please use the chat function. Um, and on Facebook, of course, we're looking at the comments there. So you're more than welcome to um, participate in that way as well. Um, I will also just know that we have a very strong um, line of panelists here and online. So I would just kind of like to ask all of our panelists to stick to their five minute limit, um, just to make sure that everyone has um, the floor and, and we can hear um, everyone's full remarks. That being said, uh, I would like to pass the floor for his welcome words to Professor Andy Nieneker, who is the president of the Battle Peace Office, uh, but also a youth fusion elder. Um, so, Andy, we're here for your welcome words. Thank you, everyone. That was <laughs> Good morning, honorable panel, speakers, and the co chairs, organizers of this year's intergenerational forum. Joining us from UK, France, Czech Republic, Russia, and Switzerland. Good morning to our Zoom participants. As president of the Basel Peace Office, and I'd like to extend you a cordial welcome. Given the limited success of the recent COP27 uh, uh, meeting in Sharm el Sheikh, many of us elders share the frustrations of the young people. Uh, all over the world. Even leading researchers agree and discuss nowadays pros and cons uh, of climate militancy. Although this may not necessarily help their professional career, a headline in last week's New York Times read, I was fired for speaking up about climate change. In the article, the author, Rose Abramoff, a climate scientist mentioned that he was let go by the U.S. Oak Ridge Laboratory for holding up a banner at the December American Geophysical Union meeting that read, out of the lab into the streets. Is, isn't that very harmless and very important to say, out of the lab into the streets? With you, we are worried about the mega problems and threats facing mankind today, compounding each other and endangering the human habitat, the climate effects, the ongoing wars, even in the very heart of Europe, with one nuclear power threatening with nuclear weapons and not less dangerous, the growing trends of nationalism threatening democracy in some nations. While as individuals, we are in our, we in our generation are as helpless as many of young people, all of us can organize ourselves, join active organizations and work together as we practice this in the NGO Youth Fusion, for example. In fact, transgenerational dialogue nowadays and transgenerational cooperation nowadays is more important than ever. And whereas we elders need to understand your impatience, we should, through our adult networks, 
constructively support your efforts by action, financially and politically. Young people have become aware of these threatening factors, obviously, have the stamina, knowledge, creativity and motivation, and will increasingly need to participate and influence the public discussion as members of NGOs and even in political action by joining political parties. Some of you may have read another recent article in the New York Times with the title, History May Absolve the Soup Throwers. It was the story of two young activists who threw tomato soup to a Van Gogh famous paintings. Here you see them. And the, the famous painting Sunflowers at the National Gallery in London. In doing so, they shouted, are you more concerned about the protection of a painting or the protection of our planet and its people? No damage was done because the painting luckily was protected by glass. Similar actions by concerned young people uh, are happening in many places nowadays, be it in museums, in university auditoriums, in front of the city hall, or as roadblocks against new highways, or as protests against nuclear proliferation. Given these threats and the environmental degradation versus the slow response of industry and the inertia of political action, creative and attention-grabbing actions by the youth are necessary and are increasingly understood, even the occasional civil disobedience. In this regard, I believe that as long as property destruction can be avoided, critique by people who consider themselves opinion leaders are wrong if they propose that acts like the tomato soup event would degrade the artists and their work. Criticizing that something beautiful and valuable may be destroyed, in fact, renders the very best arguments for the actions of the young activists. After all, if it is so bad, if something beautiful and valuable is destroyed, how about focusing on our own habitat, the Earth? Wishing you a very, very good meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Nitekar, for your very inspiring and very interesting uh, speech about the youth in action, about the movement, uh, the politics that is done on the streets and inside the museums. Uh, provoking attention uh, like this to the threat and threats and the challenges of today. Now I would like to invite to this podium for the opening comments, Mr. Lucas Ott from President Topic of the Basel Stadt Canton. Please, Mr. Ott. Thank you very much, dear participants dear friends, dear guests. I am very pleased to welcome you all here in Basel. And I am particularly pleased that Basel is hosting this international event that addresses the issues of climate protection, peace, and nuclear disarmament. The dangers posed by nuclear weapons and the effects of climate change do not stop at national borders. They can only be addressed if all government, civil, society, and private sector actors, if all participate in the process. This requires actors like you who are resolutely committed to peace, security, and climate protection. In this dialogue, which we must conduct together, the question of how we can achieve sustainable and future-proof development arises again and again. I agree with you, of course, that this is not a question we have been asking ourselves since today, but it is a question that must be asked again and again in view of current developments there is war, war in Europe again, new challenges, all the measures taken so far to so far to reduce CO2 emissions are not enough, but also the advancing opportunities 
to set new accents. The goal we want to achieve is clearly outlined. A post hotel sustainable, peaceful future. How we achieve this goal must be constantly readjusted. That's why we need our dialogue and why we need new initiatives and projects all the time. The focus here is on open cooperation and networking. This is how we contribute to sustainability, but also to security and peace. Concepts that unfortunately can no longer be taken for granted today. It's a matter of mutual dependency that we have to keep reminding ourselves of. Without sustainability, there is no peace and no security, and vice versa, without sustainability, there is no peace and no security. In view of the complex challenges we face, it's more important today than ever before not only to safeguard today's quality of life for the future, but also to safeguard our livelihoods. If we want sustainable development, we need to network even better across borders. We must work together across organizational, institutional, thematic and professional boundaries in an open, cross-order and intergenerational way. We are called to work together to find the best solutions together. So how we come together to find innovative and economically, socially and ecologically sustainable solutions in what we need to discuss today. With this in mind, I would like to thank you all very much for your commitment and wish you, wish you a stimulating, inspiring, and successful event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Up for, the, for your words and also for highlighting that, you know, without sustainability, there is no, there is no peace and without peace, there is no sustainability. I think that's a very, uh, very good theme for, for today's event. Um, thank you also um, to, to Basil Stadt-Kenson and of course, Andy Niederger for supporting the PC Awards, uh, which you will hear more about towards the end of this event. With this, um, I'm extremely honored to open the panel uh, part of, of today's event. Um, introduce the very first speaker in this panel. Um, the speaker probably needs not much of an introduction. Um, it's Fabian Hamilton, the UK MP. Um, I'll just say that um, he's probably known for his for his biking, but more likely you'll know him for as a for his work as a UK Shadow Minister for Peace and Disarmament. So, Mr. Hamilton, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Vanda. Thank you very much, Vanda. Uh, and thank you to uh, Basel for that and to the organizers of the Basel Peace Forum for today. And thank you to my friend and colleague, Alan Ware, uh, for uh, inviting me uh, through PNND. Um, I've uh, done this job now. Let me just get my timer out so I don't overrun. I've uh, been doing this job now as Shadow Minister for Peace and Disarmament uh, for almost exactly seven years. Um, and over that time, I've had the chance to reflect on what it is that contributes to conflict, because as has already been said so eloquently, you cannot have sustainability without peace, you can't have peace without sustainability. But I also believe you can't have peace, true peace, uh, without uh, uh, abolishing inequality. And one of the thoughts, there are two, two thoughts that I wanted to share with you today. One is that we must look within ourselves for the causes of anger and conflict. So there's the, the psychological, if you like. How many of us can say that we've never been angry about something irrational, uh, that we've never tried to lash out when we've been cross, and it might be something very, very trivial, or it might be a very serious issue about the state of the world and the appalling poverty and conflict we see around us. 
or nuclear weapons indeed. But stemming that tide of anger is one way of ensuring that we don't rouse up uh, the anger amongst ourselves collectively. Now, there's um, a very good saying we have in the British trade union movement, which is that if you take a strand of cotton, you can pull it apart. But if you combine that strand of cotton with a thousand other strands, you have an unbreakable rope. And so it is with us as a movement. That if we do things on our own, as has been pointed out already, you can be picked off. But if we do them collectively, as we've seen so effectively in other countries, Iran, I mean, the example that comes to mind where the women there have shown their anger at a system that oppresses them for being women in the name of religion, which we know many of us is not what Holy Quran says is actually what the Ayatollahs say, what the men say. They can be strong. They can defeat the system. They haven't done it yet, but it is fatally damaged, in my opinion. So let's look at inequality for a minute. The book by Katie Pickett of York University with Richard Wilkinson called The Spirit Bell is a brilliant economics book that shows how levels of inequality contribute to social ills, both psychological ills, but more importantly, social ills, whether that's crime, drug addiction, or all the other ills that we see. And in the more equal societies, you have a more a greater balance of lives, of happiness, of, and you have less fewer of the indicators like suicide, for example, like criminality, uh, like drug gangs and so on, all the things that we know destroy civilized society. And so I got to thinking that if we're going to seriously uh, deal with the threat of nuclear weapons, we have first to deal with the reasons for conflict itself. And why is it that certain nations, my own included, feel that having a nuclear arsenal somehow brings with them greater security in society and in the world. We know the opposite is true, in fact. Human security is based on the idea that we can all share the fruits of our labor and the fruits of our planet equally. Now, you'll never gain an equal society. We know that. But you can actually change the balance. And like many of you, I've traveled across the world and I've seen in societies uh, those which have extreme wealth and extreme poverty and the ills that brings with and the potential conflict. So I would pose to you today that one of the biggest threats to human civilization and the future of humanity, something which I believe our youth can address, is inequality. And it's inequality that drives nations to believe that they can invest in or spend hard-earned cash, which they don't have, on nuclear weapons, which will somehow make them more secure. We know it won't. And we have to win that argument that it is nuclear weapons that are the threat to our very future of the existence, not only of humanity, human civilization, but this glorious, wonderful planet that gives us all life. We have to make sure that we convey that idea that the greater threat is to human insecurity is inequality. And with that comes the rape of our planet for profit. We have to get away from that because otherwise humanity has no future. But I know looking at the young people here and what I've heard so far, we do have a future because we have some committed, dedicated young people with us elders there to advise, assist, and ensure that we don't destroy this planet and that we can save it, not only ecologically, but from the perils of nuclear weapons. Well, Mr. Hamilton, thank you very much for this very inspiring speech, uh, mentioning the factors of inequality around the world. A lot of great greatness uh, is achieved uh, based on inequality, but then the masses have the image of prosperity that they address back with nostalgia into the past. They say, in the past, we were big empire, we were great, uh, but they uh, forget that inequality also existed. And a lot of great things achieved happened because of the fight for more equality, for uh, more opportunity, for more freedom. 
thank you very much, Mr. Hamilton. And now I would like to invite to this podium uh, Mr. Subasa Shinoara, the Secretary General of Association of Swiss Lawyers for Against Nuclear Arms, Chair Founder, uh, Sakna Youth Forum, and PhD candidate in law at University of Lausanne. Please warmly welcome. <laughs> So, thank you so much for everyone and also especially for the organizers to invite me to share my ideas with you in the Peace Plus Peace Forum. So that's why I'm really pleased to be here. So today I will briefly talk about the law of international law, human rights, and also youth generations in the field of your nuclear disarmament. Because personally, I already involved in this field for seven years. When I was 22 years old, I already started in this field. But I can I could not see a lot of young generations, unfortunately. But now it's complete change after seven years. There's so many young generations get involved. So that's why I want to say again well, what the youth, youth generation can do in this field. So so briefly, because we don't have the much time for the for this panel uh, session, so just I try to point out three points for the international law. One is the uh, is Article Two of the Paragraph Four of the United Nations uh, Charter that is prohibits the the use of force by the state, and also there is in the field of nuclear disarmament there is the NPT, that's the Non Proliferation Treaties. That is also important treaty, but there is the disadvantage because they try to divide two states. One is the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states. So, and at the same time, there is also the judgment uh, by the ICJ, International Court of Justice. It calls the uh, wait. So, the legality of the treat uh, threats or use of nuclear weapons. That is the Western opinion. It says that the use of nuclear weapons is totally prohibited the nuclear uh, no, international law, especially international human law. And but but they the ICJ did not say that they cannot decide lawful is lawful or not. So that's why uh, we did not say that there is a total prohibit of the nuclear disarmament. And so that's why there is the new movement, there is the treaty, the EGNW Treaty on the prohibition of wait, the yeah, nuclear weapons. <laughs> <laughs> because of the English is not my nearly speak, so <laughs> but so that's why that is a really huge step. But the nuclear uh, weapon states always strongly opposed to this regime. So the question is, what should we do? So, especially for the SACNA, the Association of Swiss Lawyers for Nuclear Disarmament, uh, takes a step for the uh, the new initiative from the human rights perspective, because recently human rights, uh, we and some NGO tries to create some uh, statements on the uh, human rights uh, council on the new universal periodic review uh, concerning the light of life, because that is the uh, general comment number number thirty six uh, on the light of life already say that if he use the nuclear weapons, threats for use of nuclear weapons is clearly violates the rights to life. So that's why we try to base on it, and then you create some of the statement to create the new initiative. So it's the conclusion. So international is already trying to legalize the new use of nuclear weapons, but not totally. So that's why the SAFNA tries to create such kind of the step to use new human rights to uh, push forward another step of the nuclear disarmament. But what youth generation can do? That is the main question for us, especially I'm also the part of the young generation. So that's why I recently created Safna Youth Forum in order to create some opinion forum for the youth generation to, to say their opinion freely. Because normally during seven years, it's really difficult to say my opinion because of the lack of knowledge of nuclear disarmament, because of the you know little bit hesitations to talk with the you know the professional in this field, so that's why I created this in order to promote the youth generation. So that is not limited for the nationality. You can also join it if you uh, if you are interested. So yeah, that's all. Thank you so much for 
macam kucing ni. Thank you so much for your remarks for um, your brief introduction to the international law side of things, but also for speaking about the, the youth efforts and congratulations um, on, on your efforts to help youth raise their voices and make them heard. That's, that's super important as a fellow young person in the new greatest armaments. We are very, very much appreciate um, all you do. Um, it is now a great honor of mine to introduce the next speaker, you might have noticed that even in this event, we're, we're talking a lot about the AC Awards that are coming on Saturday. Um, so the next speaker is also connected to this uh, to this award. Um, is Professor Lucas Kunder, the director of the Reformed Church of Public Staff and uh, um, an institution that also supports uh, the AC Awards um, and the young people that are doing amazing, amazing things around the world to, to make this world a better place. So, Professor, the floor is yours. Good morning. If you're still quick, you're still awake. Yes. <laughs> um, first, I have to apologize for my English. I never learned English in school, and uh, as as a Christian religious leader, I had to learn uh, Latin all the week and Hebrew. So for me, it's, <laughs> it's easier to talk in Hebrew than in English. So I, I think maybe you'll understand. <laughs> um, dear peace workers, you give me and many a chance to celebrate 2023 as a year of joy. The best was that among the entries of the PC projects, I was able to participate in the uh, to participate in the jury process. Jury process. Sorry, <laughs> you 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 gave us eighteen projects from all over the world. What is encouraging for an old man is the fact that he knows the bond which is produced by helping others. This warmth or heat, I feel by judging your many projects and all of the jury found it. For the first time, the Basel Relations communities take part of the PC Awards. This, our award is called the name Peace and Justice are kissing each other. That was also the name of the reunion, which in 1989 brought together Orthodox, Catholics, and Protestants for the first time since the Reformation here in Basel. Peace and justice kiss each other is a quote of Psalm 85, Peace and justice were two gods at the time when the psalm originally was written. They were a love couple. We are monotheists and pray this psalm as Jews and Christians. It is especially important and united in our prayer we talk to God. Peace and justice are no gods any longer, but realities in life, which we bring to God with all our passion. Peace cannot exist without justice and vice versa. The two kiss another with passion. The Basel Synagogue and the churches give this prize, and we do it humbly in all modest before you all believe in peace and justice, working as lawyers, socialists, socialists, theologists, ecologists, artists, architects, you all contribute that everything is kissing each other so that peace remain and is created. And please work with us for reconciliation between the religions in the world. Blessed are the peace workers, for they shall be called daughters and sons of God. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Your English is very, very well. Very <laughs> <laughs> so of course, thank you for presenting the, the uh, position, the side of the reform of the church uh, as well. We know, uh, of course, of the peace building work that the missionaries do in the areas, in the regions of uh, conflict zones as well, how they support the, uh, the faithful uh, people. Um, and uh, on this, uh, I would um, proceed to, uh, with great pleasure, to our next uh, speaker, um, Madam Margaret Pina Neller, who will represent the PNND Council. A um, she's a member also of the uh, former member of parliament, former chair of the OEC Parliamentary Assembly Committee on Democracy, Human Rights, and Humanitarian Questions. Madam um, Pina Neller. Thank you very much. I try to live up to the challenge to share with you experience and inspiration for a sustain sustainable future. It's my wish that climate use link with peace movements and that each climate action prominently make peace visible. In this respect, I would like to commend the young socialists of Switzerland for having done the how to march to the WEF in Davos last Sunday under the slogan, tax the rich, save the climate, and for having launched a national Swiss national initiative to this effect. Next slide, please. Two weeks ago, I was shocked to see this poster. The next one, it will come on. Yes. I was shocked in a train station of Bern, Switzerland, to see this uh, ad of the Swiss Broadcasting Company featuring a red tank. Behind it popped up immediately a, bru a very brutal war scene of tank um, uh, featuring tanks in, in full war scene. And um, I must say media, in our area of this world seem to like to show war and war scenes. It's three dimensional, it's, uh, it can be shown. And we have to oppose to this, our culture of peace. It has been already pointed out by the, the former speakers here, how what is important elements to build up this culture of peace. For instance, one organization, which I represent also is Peace Women Across the Globe, which had nominated 1,000 women of all countries of this world for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2005. And we are still working on this, extending the biographies of, the, of such women. And I encourage all of you to publish about the women and men, young and older, who are doing this very important peace work today. By awarding tomorrow, Saturday here, this uh, Pacey Award, I think it's great, or by remembering the very important 2022 United States Peace Prize awarded, do you know to whom? Dear public, awarded to the Watson Institute of Brown University for its very crucial research on the costs of United States wars, the human, environmental, economical, social, and political costs of US wars. Next slide is a photograph I took last Sunday in Dresden at the site of the Rosa Luxemburg Monument. Rosa Luxemburg was brutally murdered in 1919 after writing passionately against imperialism and capitalism. The Austrian author Ingeborg Bachmann wrote, and I quote, history has many students, only they don't seem to learn. 
why do I say this with respect to this site in Dresden? I'm myself quite appalled that in Dresden, which I visited three days over the last weekend, very little mention of what national socialism did in the Holocaust in the same city of Dresden, hardly any more mentioning of the insane bombings the Allied forces, British and American, did in the very late phase of World War II on the living areas, living quarters of the city of Dresden. So please let us all study history and to see how fast these regimes can change. When I was a young student, the 25 to 30, at the University of St. Gallen, I uh, was always a working student. And um, I was working in a cellar of the University of St. Gallen to earn money. And my job was to inventorize a big library of a law professor, German, Swiss German law professor, Walter Wu, who had donated a huge library of mainly German law literature to this university. And it contained very many books uh, of German legal literature comments written between the important years of 1915 and then up to 1940. And by doing this job, myself becoming a lawyer later on, I could see how within 10 years only the whole uh, legislation, of course, and all the comments were switched gradually to a totally fascist national socialistic um, regime and ideology, which had caused tens of millions of dead afterwards. So we know law does what the main politics command. Law is not a value. Law is an executive branch, if I may say so. Um, please. Next. Yes, 1325. I have to be a bit shorter maybe on this, but um, seeing I work on peace tables in Eastern Ukraine, 2021, and other parts of the world, please, I exhort you, always mention 1325 because this is such a landmark resolution. And in my eyes, it's not enough to always keep talking on gender or to always keep talking on women, peace, security. This is the new frame, WPS, uh, women, peace, security. No, 1325 is the basis. And it's a very good, excellent text. It's a long text, please read it. It's the result of decades of women's organizations, um, movements, and it was adapted 20 years ago unanimously by uh, Security Council. It uh, clearly states why it is compulsory to have women's equal participation on all levels in conflict prevention and resolution in all peace processes, of course, and reconstruction at the wars and armed conflicts. And when we saw um, last March, this, this negotiation table with a 100% male delegation from Ukraine and a 100% male delegation from Russian Federation. This is a no go. Positive example, uh, Colombia with the Truth Commission. We had the speaker yesterday in one of the fora and uh, one of the Ruta um, Revolucionaria in uh, Colombia, which uh, our organization, Peace Women Across the Globe, facilitated, managed to bring feminist elements based on 1325 in the, in the negotiations and in the process. In the process. Yes, thank you. Next, please. I can cut this a bit shorter because uh, our colleague from Japan has already elaborated on the international um, Framework, I will cut this, but with uh, 
homage to Japan, I brought a peace messenger from Nagasaki. <laughs> Uh, this was given to me by a group of young students from Nagasaki who recently visited Bern and Europe. And it reads Peace Messenger from Nagasaki, and it quotes the Constitution of Japan, Chapter 1, Renunciation of War. And I pray and hope this will remain the Constitution of Japan. Um, Yesterday, we heard interesting debates. However, yesterday, I heard no mention of nuclear, none. Please join the campaigns of the Basel Peace Office. Thematize the fact that these international bases are there. Please thematize that there is a position paper on the website of Basel Peace Office, uh, which gives concrete proposals how in your countries also the authorities, if they haven't already done so, parliaments or governments can promote the uh, nuclear disarmament and the reduction of nuclear risk. I myself was able to look at this proposal paper to the Swiss Ministry of Foreign Affairs one month ago in Bern in view of its use uh, by Switzerland in the Security uh, Council seat. And I would like to stress in favor of the Swiss MFA uh, that uh, they do have an open door. This could also be used as an example for your countries and your organizations they signal an open door to civil society or whoever to bring in initiatives, to bring in suggestions. They are open the ambassadors who are in charge of the UN section at MFA. They are, they are open. So let's work. Last slide, please. Yes, SDG 16. In my view, SDG 16 sums it up very nicely. Promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. That's what, what it's all about. And um, when I look at this, I must pay tribute to Jacinta Ardern, Prime Minister of New Zealand, with uh, her Labour Party. They have done excellent jobs. I have analyzed and written about, published about it in a German publication, with German, German pub publication. They have elaborated the well-being budget, which first, and via a participatory process um, defines the political and social goals to be achieved in the next budget or financial planning years, and then allocates the means. Whereas in most parts of the world, it's done the other way around. Uh, yeah, I think that's enough uh, to say, and also, uh, in view of providing access to justice for all, and I will uh, close on this, I would like to link up to what Fabian has said about primarily um, uh, eliminating poverty and uh, income inequality. And as a practicing attorney now for 36 years, um, I must say the most essential is that each person can have access to free legal aid. And New Zealand offers this. Alan will co contradict if it's not like that. But all the texts I saw uh, that lived in New Zealand at young age one year, um, in New Zealand, you can get free legal aid at the municipal offices. And this is a basis because often, Often the laws are even there, or the legal rem rem remedies are even there, or the trade unions are there, but the people 
don't know about it. So please stress SDG 16 and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Margaret, for this Thank substantial, you. very direct, uh, detailed speech. You mentioned the resolution on women, peace, and security. You made me immediately remember the resolution on youth, peace, and security as well, 2250. Uh, and uh, it, it reminded me of a film by Liliana Cavani, the student of Lucina Visconti. She made a film, Lepo the Skin, about the occupation in Italy. Uh, during the Second World War. And there is a phrase that I wrote down into my notebook. Uh, there is an Italian, Italian man, he says, Gini, we lost the war. And he gets a response, the women and the children lost it more than anybody else. They are the first group that... Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to continue, even from this very sensible topic. And we have to continue. I have to give the word to Monsieur Philippe Rio, Mayor of Grigny from France, who will speak to us in French, President of Mayors for Peace France. Monsieur Grigny, la parole est à vous, s'il vous plaît. Je vous en prie. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. First of all, I would like to thank the Basel Peace Forum teams to inviting me. I represent the French branch of Mayor for Peace, a global network of local authority whose secretary is based in Hiroshima, Can Japan. Can it be louder, please? And which is dedicated to the dissemination of the culture of peace and historically, since its inception 40 years ago to the elimination of nuclear weapons. Our network is supported by more than 8,268 member communities in 166 countries and regions of the world representing over 1 billion citizens. Our programs of activity are in line with the United Nations through 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development with a particular focus on Goal 16, promote peaceful, inclusive, and equitable society and the goal 17, strengthen partnership and network to achieve this goal. Obviously, this the, also resonates with the eight pillars of UNESCO culture of peace. <coughs> Furthermore, in order to promote a program of action in a European scale, the European member city have joined forces and decide to create a European chapter in 2019. The presidency of which is currently held by the mayor of Granolos in Spain, I warmly welcome her. We are all driven by a common desire at the heart of the Mayor for Peace Network, the certainty that city diplomacy and municipalism are two decisive keys to winning peace. Mayor and local decision makers are closed to the issue of, the, of their habitants and can make the choice to spread the culture of peace and ensure the security of their constituents. Moreover, at the local level, we are faced with problems that are often the result of program and worldwide issue. To take the two examples given of this panel, which are often linked, such as climate change and armed conflicts, in both cases, 
It is the citizens who are affected in the first instance as a throat direct effect. Bombings and humanitarian disaster, destruction and deterioration of infrastructure in the environment, logistical and transport problems, or through indirect effects. In the short and long term, health problem, increased poverty, famine, displacement of population, or for population that are further away from the conflict through major economic effects, as we are seeing with the current crisis. This is why we, as a city, have to send um, uh, uh, excuse me, have to stand up and find a solution, solution to protect our population. In my city, for example, we are taking action to lower energy price. We have, we have drawn up a plan to fly poverty for human rights. We are fighting against intern neighborhood violence, which is a real scourge in your area. And we are working with the, all the service to spread the culture of peace in the city, especially among young people. To do this, we develop complex programs based on major international events as 26 September, International Day for the Total Elimination of Nuclear Weapons, or the International Day of Peace on 21 September. This year, we will also take advantage for, to organize a life peace concert as part of a new international program combining peace and music, peace and culture. So, yes, it is also locally in their city that young people get involved to the project, work and advocacy that we are carrying out. The commitment of young people to their neighborhoods, to well-being for ecology and disarmament, but also in sport, in culture, in social issues, and human, one, and human rights for true equality between men and women against discrimination and racism bring a strong dynamic to society. It is obvious. Young people are always a solution, not the problem. Whatever the subject, and this have an incredible capacity for action. It is up to us, decision makers and elect representative to accompany the youth, the movement for peace and freedom. Finally, I would like to point, you, to point out that these two days times will celebrate the second anniversary of the entry into force of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, NPT, an indispensable instrument to contribute to global nuclear disarmament which implements international law prohibiting the suite of use of nuclear weapons affirmed by the International Court of Justice in the United Human Rights Committee. As of September 2022, 91 states have seen the treaty 68 have ratified it, but no nuclear weapon state has done so. No nuclear weapon country reached to be observed country at the first meeting of states party and is not interested in dialogue. I have written to the president of French Republic, 
Emmanuel Macron on this subject on Thursday. The issue of nuclear weapons is intimately linked to the multiple crises we are facing. The invasion of Ukraine, a non-nuclear power by Russia, a nuclear power, as we heard this fully, leading to an energy crisis for the European continent, accompanied by price rises, and for many other countries, such as in Africa, a serious food crisis. The invasion also reveals that nuclear deterrence is not about protection, but about <laughs> being on this offensive and does not allow for conflict resolution. Moreover, the possession of nuclear weapon alone carries a high risk of accidental or terrorist use. The use of a single wizard would cause such humanitarian and environmental disaster that reconstruction will be decayed and will affect the health of peoples and their descendants for life. In the Mayor for Peace Network, we know this only too well and that, and that is why we are committed to raise a rind of the history of humanity and of these issues. Without targeting that the public money allocated and this detention and renovation could be used to finance public service such ecology, education and health with our essential to our society. I know that young and old we share this observation Thank you for attention. Excuse me for my English. <laughs> Merci beaucoup, Mayor, Mayor Rio, for, for your intervention. We have a lot of good English speakers standing yes. here. I don't know what you all are worried about. So. Um, no, but thank you. Thank you for introducing um, some of your. Um, um, some of your actions. Um, I immediately fell in love with the um, life peace action you're planning for September the 21st with music everywhere around the world. I absolutely cannot wait. So thank you for introducing that. Um, before final, final speaker, um, I follow you on OD and OCD scholarship alumna, uh, but also a climate security consultant at CGIRR. Um, Tina Krat, you're, um, thank you for being here with us. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you to the public Peace Office for organizing this event and for giving the space for such a timely topic and the nexus of nuclear disarmament, um, youth inclusion and climate action. Um, as we have heard, um, nuclear disarmament and climate action are cross-border issues, and they require long-lasting and inclusive solutions. But often there is the gap between the goal of having those long-term solutions and the lack, and um, there's the gap between wanting those solutions and the commitment to concrete steps by policymakers right now. And this lack of commitment undermines cooperation and effective policy, which is so necessary. Um, young actors, as they have overheard from my colleagues and also youth, uh, youth solution, um, they're so powerful actors of change. And policymakers, they would have such a great opportunity to, to tap in the power of these youth movements and to take in the power of um, youth leaders. I want to talk today about how we can have an inclusive and meaningful participation of youth in policy processes, both in climate action, but also in nuclear disarmament. First of all, I think it's important to listen to youth, and um, that means inviting youth speakers to different forums at local, national, and international level. 
For example, Switzerland will have the great opportunity when they hold the presidency in the United Nations Security Council uh, in May to invite also youth speakers to brief the Security Council and tell about their experiences. Um, I recently, because as we already heard, um, youth and women are often disproportionately affected by armed conflict. So it's very important to have these voices present. Um, I recently contributed to a study where we looked at how climate change interacts with armed conflict. And we could see that climate um, impacts on um, economic activities in areas where armed conflict is present, um, undermines livelihoods, and that can tap into recruitment processes of armed actors of youth because they offer an alternative livelihood, for example. And it's very important to hear those voices. Um, providing a platform is good, but one step further would be to really engage with youth and have an institutionalized, institutionalized youth English. Um, there are already great, um, there are great initiatives out there. For example, um, the United Nations Secretary General has a youth advisory group. So he's regularly briefed by um, seven youth leaders that bring in their perspectives on climate action. The regular contact between policymakers and youth allows to have these accountability mechanisms, which is so important. It's important to have this place for feedback so that we can also call if the progress is not enough. Um, then to take it even one step further from listening and engaging with you, I really think that working um, with and for you in an intergenerational manner is the best way to do it. Um, we can generations learn each other. Uh, and for that, um, the systematic mainstreaming of having young people at the table of decision making is very important. Um, to bring in one example, the preparatory commission of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, um, they regularly invite um, members of their youth group to have a seat at um, you know, at policy forums, and not only to talk about youth issues, but really bringing a perspective on technical issues. And talking about having youth um, at the table, what can be done is continue funding training programs, is to continue to have mentoring for young people, which are so important to build the capacity so that youth can be a meaningful actor of change and decision making table. And um, lastly, I want to emphasize that. Youth is not a homogeneous group of people. Um, we are all our different, and when we include youth, we I think we should take an intersectional approach and also make sure that we have diverse representation of gender, social class, different geographical um, background. I hope we can all um, yeah make sure that youth have their thank you so much. That your speech made my heart so happy and so warm. Thank, thank you for that. But also thank you for being the prime example of you know that young people anymore. This we're stuck by the words. Not just young people being the experts on the on the youth. Young people are the experts or can be the experts. So thank you, Tina, for being the prime example of that and for being here with us today. Um, this concluded the the panel um, part of today's event. And I think we're all um, are more than excited for for the um, discussion or the Q and A, you know, the Q and A um, part. Um, we've got questions both from participants participants online, and I'm assuming there will be questions in person as well. Uh, so Ilya we will take care of the questions here, and then I'll take a look at the Q and A box or if there are any uh, comments on Facebook. Um, please do not hesitate to ask. Uh, goes without saying there are no dumb questions. This is a very safe space. Um, we've got about um, 20 minutes, I think. Um, so I'll give the floor over to Ilya. Um, and yeah, have a great, have a great debate. So questions about this event here. Yes, sir. So uh, I'm representing UNICEF Foundation and Public Health Switzerland. I would like to draw your attention to the mental issues, mental problems. Uh, actually, the fact that I'm aware of this during the pandemic, about 26% uh, of young people have serious uh, mental 
uh, health problems. But even before the pandemic, uh, 10 years before, uh, you know, suicidality and uh, depression disorders, not only in Switzerland, Europe worldwide has risen uh, considerably. And uh, of course, the, the multiple crisis we live in uh, is, is one of the, of the main causes. But on the other hand, and that's my point, and, and that's what I'm related to your, to your um, <clears throat> statement, it's really very important that young people are not just um, uh, homeless in the situation of apocalyptic news, but they have to be active. They have, they, they have to participate in, in solutions for the future, and, and this is this is one way to give them hope to be active, not just to be passive uh, um, during all this, all this, um, this, uh, um, yeah, this stress. And just to mention, we are organizing in May a uh, national conference where young people are actually um, presenting their threats, their hopes, and what they think would be the, the solutions. And they are just addressing politicians and administration. And so we we have uh, engaged all the young people organizations to participate and they're actually preparing this conference. And uh, it's it's the, the voice of young people who want to, to give them a platform addressing issues of young people. And I would like to come back to you after that for a kind of participation of young people. Thank you very much for mentioning this aspect as well about the mental health and the post COVID recovery for the groups that can be a risk to economic or certain. Well, how about our chat box? Do we have any questions pending? We, we do indeed. So, two, two comments from the online world so far. A, just two, and that also goes for the in person audience. Um, the speech of uh, Mayor Rio, uh, we have it written. The in person participants have received another piece of paper. So, I'm assuming we can also publish it online for those of you who would like to give it a read. Um, and then the second question uh, came actually from, from New Fusion. So, I'm happy that we've got some um, New Fusion followers online. Um, on Facebook, um, the question was about uh, maybe maybe towards uh, Tina. Um, young people are often uh, given the space to you know be at the table, but um, some experiences have said that they feel like they are not really being listened to or perceived as experts. So how can we tackle this? A obviously to give youth the space, but also actual listen to them, and then. Um, Take them as, as you know, comfort, and then if so, maybe if you could, you could address that. That's uh, such a comment, and yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, when preparing, I was thinking about how we can meaningfully have the voice of youth at the table, and it's not so easy because even if you have the seat, it doesn't mean that you know it can really be um, meaningful in a way. So, I mean, what I can say is that. It's, it's not only on the youth to be there, but it's also on the other side of the table to really um, you know, listen to youth and engage with them and continually have space to to speak and, and listen. Um, yeah, so it's it's on everyone to make sure that we can mainstream the intergenerational approach. Um, so that's how, do you have a similar experience? Yeah, I have a similar experience. So that's why I established my own associations concerning the youth generation, because normally, by there is the space for the young generations to say something, but the, it's very difficult to influence the policy decision because of the lack of the experience, lack of the knowledge. And then they think, yeah, if the young generation has a voice, that's it. They don't listen. My experience, but I don't know all the others, from my experience. So that's why I think that we try to collect the youth generation voice by my association for youth, youth fusion and then tries to express in public. That is the good way, I think. So, yeah. So let, let's not have only the, the young people talk about young people. Andy, you have your hand up, please. It is said, it, is, it was said today that young people have the expertise in many things nowadays, and I agree. What my political experience is, if you as a young person enter a discussion with a group of elders, 
You need to have it on a small paper, you need to have your points present to leave it at the end because the, all, the elders may not be so quick and they may not have the expertise, but when you have, when you have it written down what you want, it, you leave something behind and you are more likely to have a reaction on that than if you just yak and uh, even so you may very, be very engaged. So that is my experience and I always do it. Thank you, Andy. Excellent. Actually, constructive feedback. <laughs> Thank you. Really sounds like a dialogue of generations now already. So <laughs> <hearing what> should... <laughs> yes, um, you had a question? Sir? Yes, it goes a bit in the same direction. And I was wondering also about maybe not only, yeah, because I think what is happening a lot is that young people are quite active in activist groups or no, we see a lot of movement happening for young people because it's a place where you can make yourself be heard and where you can maybe be heard with a lower, yeah, you don't have that many steps to be heard. Um, but I think there, so there is a bit this, and then we have the more institutionalized kind of work, policy levels of work, and, and how can we maybe also make it more attractive? Now, maybe that's also a question that people, young generations also don't feel like, um, they enter and they're tokenized, they're not really listened to what we've heard. But maybe it's there again, it's like two way street of how can we attract more young people to it so that they also don't feel intimidated in that by the situation. So, yeah, it got a bit in this direction, maybe also how then activism can influence the policy level and the more institutional as well, but also the other way around, because then at the same time as activism, I think. Elder generations are needed as well with their experiences. No, and probably often already the work and the process have been put into already long time before. So that maybe on this question, I don't know. Could I reformulate your question and address it to those of us of, of you who were the people in politics and parliaments? As would you observe that it is the continuation of the May '68 and following uh, revolutionary changes when the uh, young people uh, enter the non-traditional uh, uh, establishments and when they indeed the, the politics happen again on the roof on the streets, but uh, with with the young people with these all these movements because a lot of progress uh, has been achieved. I think uh, because of this engaged, uh, passionate youth that went to fight for a lot of uh, rights and freedoms, including a lot of sexual uh, liberation, uh, sort of. Can I address what you said uh, directly? Because I'm not so old that I can't remember being young. Some people are. And I remember one of my first impressions when I joined uh, the British Labour Party, where I currently live. And we were in our mid 20s at the time, my wife and I, we just got married. And it was this sense that whatever we said, we were being patronized by people who are now my, you know, my age then, uh, the age I am now. Um, and that we didn't know what we were talking about. We weren't listened to. Our idealistic enthusiasm uh, was uh, squashed. So I think in my older self, I want to remember my younger self and the feelings I felt trying to influence people who were 20, 30, 40 years older than I was uh, when I was uh, idealistic and young. I'm still idealistic, I'm old now. Uh, but, but that's something we should never forget. Uh, every one of us who's attained the age of 60 plus uh, was once young. And we, if you're like me, I was I've been involved in politics in the UK since, as I say, well, since I was a, a student in my teens, um, and always felt at the time that those older people, even though they may have only been in their fifties at the time, which is quite young now to me, by the way, um, were saying, "No, no, no, shut up! You don't know what you're talking about." And yes, we did go out on the streets. And actually, when I was twenty, we occupied the administrative headquarters of the University of York uh, in a protest against tuition fees being charged to overseas students. So if you come from Switzerland, France, or Germany to study in the UK at York University, you're being charged three times more uh, than a domestic student, uh, which is actually still the case, only the fees are 100 times higher. So, you know, this was an idealistic thing, uh, but we were squashed by the old people in the administration. Uh, and I think we should remember that and, and always therefore listen to what people are saying to us when they're young and enthusiastic. They may not have the experience we've got, but they've got something to say. 
and they're going to be around a lot longer than we are. Yes, um, uh, thinking back over the 1960s, uh, 1968, I was um, 15 years young. And of course, our main, it was the time of Woodstock, but it was the time of women's sleep. It was the time of black women in the, in the United States. But it, our main slogan was also make love, not war. And I think of this very, very often today, nowadays, we should push this more and we should push the music and the culture and the humor uh, with all this digitalization. Uh, somehow life also seems to be impoverished in a way with all the assets uh, digitalization can bring for peaceful societies. Um, uh, times have changed. Uh, what I would like to say is that by um, getting into contact with MPs uh, or at, uh, at other levels, executive uh, members, just um, go again, again, again. You have to do it by repetition. Sure. I mean, what what ha has my generation in this small country of Switzerland had to do to obtain slow and very small progress in women's rights? And we are not yet at the end. And all women and the society worldwide must um, allow each girl and woman of this world to be in full control of her body throughout her entire life. And also in Poland and also in all countries of this world, in Africa included. Uh, as long as we have this oppression of girls and women on the sexual, you 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 took the keyword sexual, Ilya. Uh, as long as we have this oppression and uh, intimidation, partly of girls and women, uh, we will not have the peace and the the, the peace we need. Um, just lobby, lobby, lobby. Um, I was also at the forefront of the LGBT movement in Switzerland, in Switzerland and worldwide. Um, and I came, and I will finish on this, I came to the conclusion, um, I was talking to LGBT uh, movement in Minsk, for instance, Belarus, and uh, I was saying, well, maybe it's not putting up the flag at the British embassy, the LGBT flag, Excuse me, so what? Rather than putting up the LGBT rainbow flag, use the time to, to work with your MPs uh, in Brest, in Grotna, in the cities where you live. Go talk to your MPs and do that all the time. Because now that I talk about it, the big lobbies in Switzerland, pharmaceutical lobby, banking lobby, uh, farmers lobby, the three main in Switzerland. They come to the MPs and to the members of government all the time. So please be encouraged to go all the time. Very interesting. Hammer, hammer on the MPs and hammer on the ministers and members of executive. Sorry, but I, if I may just, Margaret, please, please. I, I think the, the important, one of the most important contributing factors to achieving feminism is that men must be feminists too. Yeah, of course. Because men are part of the solution. They are the problem, but they're also part of the solution. Yes. And therefore, it's really important to get that message across. Question from the audience. From you. Good one. Uh, my name is Vaira. Uh, I represent Kosovo Defense Academy. And we actually in this a lot. And really good. I specialize in UK. Uh, I also participate in few NGOs inside the country. Um, just want to raise a cue that uh, making NGOs and the youth be more active and close to the government of decision making makes them uh, to have a more realistic approach, especially in uh, policy making and the issues that are raised inside the country. Um, the question is for uh, Mr. Fabian and uh, uh, Margaret, because you belong, you have been part of the government and you have seen 
how much is uh, what is the importance of NGOs working close to the government decision making and not leaving them as spectators and just referring by the books and making policies that are not realistic. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. What is the importance and the potential of NGOs uh, to bring up their points to MPs and members of governments? That's how I thought your question. Uh, I think I can just refer to what I said in my previous uh, statement. Um, you have to make your position available in all possible forms, but also do not neglect to, to search, if possible, the, the, the direct contact, the live contact with the MPs, and also the live um, contact with the executive members, members of government at all levels. Uh, it, we also know from history, no, no um, group of population has ever given a gift to another group. I mean to say each group, each NGO, each yeah, segment of population has always had fight and fighting means convincing the partners. And if, if the partners are of the opposite political opinion, it's hard work and it needs time. And it needs time to build up and to, to build up your own groups. Talk, right? M Margaret's absolutely right. Um, I depend very heavily on NGOs. I, by the way, I've never been a member of the UK government. I'm still hoping uh, you know, for the next couple of years. Uh, we'll see. Um, but uh, you know, I've got to this great age, and I haven't been a member of government. Look, I I, I have a regional responsibility for. Latin America, and you don't need me to tell you some of the appalling human rights and environmental abuses that have been carried out in that country. Thankfully, many of the countries of that continent are turning towards left, social democratic, progressive uh, parties who are winning elections, sometimes by a very small margin, as in Brazil recently. But the fact is that those NGOs are absolutely essential to policymakers like myself to inform us of some of the details, some of the intricacies of what's going on and what's needed. You know, you can get the broad brush picture of what's happening in a country, but you can never understand the detail unless you talk to somebody from Mexico uh, who's been arrested for being a journalist, for exposing an environmental degradation by a company that was done illegally and actually being persecuted by the state for exposing that or a local, a member of the local population, not in the Amazon, but in the Brazilian uh, river systems who depend entirely for the whole lives on the river. And that river has been polluted by the bursting of a dam, the Mariana Dam I'm thinking of in Brazil. I knew nothing about that, but they turned up in their local costume with headdresses and spoke Portuguese translated by an interpreter in a committee room in the Houses of Parliament in London. And we learned so much from them. There's no substitute from hearing from the people who are directly affected by the bad policies of their own governments, which we could possibly have some influence over. And whether that's in the UK where we do have direct influence or other countries like Brazil and Mexico where we could have some influence, it's absolutely essential. And that's just on the human rights side and the environmental side. I haven't even mentioned the peace and nuclear and weapons disarmament side. We've got some very good NGOs there. Uh, that come and meet with me regularly and come and meet with my colleagues and inform us. It's the information they can bring, as well as the persuasive arguments that actually allow us to listen and then alter our policies accordingly so that we can uh, amend them and implement them for the benefit of all the people that are being lobbied for by the NGOs. They're, they're essential to, to a healthy democracy in my opinion. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Ramon and Margaret. We will have to conclude uh, on this question by just uh, saying that this discussion was um, very pragmatic, but we also spoke about some central things as trying to answer where are we going, how are all this changing. And I have to share with you my 
uh, two very spontaneous observations. Yesterday, I suddenly read a line from the Bhagavad Gita, an Indian philosophical epos. They say that the causes of war are the unjust attitude towards women, that uh, we, um, it's, it's the violence already in the seat there from the, from the correlation between men and women. And then I read from Theodora Dorna in his Dialectics of Enlightenment. In 1947, he writes that, uh, the uh, we, we, women, they uh, through centuries imposed something that it is incomplete uh, being a woman, something needs to be added to it. And Adorno, of course, criticizes the Catholic Church approach to the image of the Virgin. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, so I think that the, this is very central, and I'm very happy that we also spoke a lot about this uh, women, peace and security, and peace and security. I pass on now to Wanda for. <laughs> thank you, Ilya. Um, there's not much left for me to do but to thank both of you here in person, but also our online audience for all your questions. Again, both online comments and Facebook messages. Um, same, same here. Uh, one final question that we got online that wasn't answered was about how can we vote for PC, but I'll leave that to Alan for his closing comments. Um, another reminder that this was being live streamed and therefore recorded on Facebook. So again, if there's anything that you'd like to come back to, you're more than welcome to. Uh, you can find that Basel Peace Office's Facebook page. Um, it's pretty easy to search for. Um, you know, throughout this whole event, I uh, you know, okay, in 2015, a little backstory. As a rep, a lot of, lots part of this world got obsessed with Hamilton, the musical, um, where they've got a line, this is not a moment, it's a movement. And I love to reuse this 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 rhyme because just just as having this this conversation it feels so 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 momentous to me. So thank you all for being a part of it. Um, it's I don't know it's been an absolute honor to be here with you all this morning and with everyone online. So by this, um, I'll give the floor to Alan, who's the director of Basel Peace Office, but also the global coordinator of PNNP, uh, to a the co-sponsors of today's event. So Alan. Over, over to you, and also please do do comments on the on the PC Awards on Saturday because people are interested. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Elia and Amanda, uh, for facilitating this. Um, and it's wonderful to come in just after Vanda's comment that this is not a moment; it's a movement. Uh, this is our fourth intergenerational forum on peace, climate, and disarmament issues. Uh, and of course, during the pandemic, there were for two years, it was totally online. Now we have a hybrid format, um, and it's wonderful to have people both here in person, which is so important to have that interface and to have the uh, spontaneous and informal parts of conversations that also happen surrounding an, an event where you can come in person. But we also welcome the people online and uh, joining us from around the world. Uh, I'm Alan Ware. I'm originally from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Aotearoa is the original uh, indigenous name, and it's also an official name. We have two names for our country. Um, and I came here to Basel because I saw how important that Switzerland is in the world in these areas of peace and disarmament. Uh, here, you know, Switzerland is hosting the United Nations in Geneva, where negotiations are happening on key peace and disarmament agreements. And also, it's the headquarters of the human rights issues that Subasa uh, talked about. You know, the Human Rights Council, the Human Rights Committee, it's where there's a universal periodic review of every country in the world comes up and civil society is there saying, how are you implementing your obligations on human rights? And as Subasa mentioned, one of those human rights is the right to freedom from the threat of annihilation of nuclear weapons. It's also the right to freedom of the threat of extinction from climate change or the climate crisis. These are in there, and we as civil society have opportunities to take voices, and particularly young voices, you know, who are current and future generations uh, into these discussions that are happening primarily in Geneva. But here, Basel is very important too, because Basel is the corner point of three countries, a non-nuclear country, Switzerland, uh, a nuclear ally, Germany, and there's nuclear weapons there in Germany, not too far from here, more than usual, but it's about three hours, I think, on the train uh, from here, and then a nuclear armed country, France. And if we're going to achieve a nuclear weapons-free world, we have to have dialogue with the different voices and the different security perspectives. And there are some who believe that we need nuclear weapons for security. 
So we need to engage in dialogue with, with those and find alternatives. What are alternative ways to find security without nuclear weapons? We can't just say your opinion doesn't make any sense because they have, that opinion is very well held and there may be valid reasons for that. My own country used to be under a nuclear alliance and most people in New Zealand believe we need to be protected by US nuclear weapons. But then we had dialogue and it was a very constructive dialogue. And I think what uh, Margaret and what Fabian have been saying about the importance of meeting with your legislators, regardless of what political party they are, or with your local legislators, count city council members and mayors. That's what we did. We didn't just talk with the environmental parliamentarians. We talked with everyone and we went to the cities and we had a very positive dialogue on how we could be secure without nuclear weapons. So now New Zealand's banned nuclear weapons. Um, and Jacinda Arden, who I mentioned has been one of the leaders of a nuclear-free New Zealand. So I am wearing the New Zealand tie today because uh, just in, in commemoration of some of our leaders. And uh, Jacinda, she was our second youngest parliamentarian ever uh, when she got elected. And the first day that she entered parliament, she joined our organization, Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Cooperation Disarmament, because she was already seen what important it is to work for a nuclear weapons free world. So we're very happy to continue this intergenerational dialogue process. This is one aspect of it. We've heard about youth fusion having an elders program. So it's not just about youth voices, but it's about youth voices engaging with others. That's the process which is important. And we have the Pacey Award, and this is really exciting. Pacey means peace, nuclear abolition, and climate engaged youth. And this was the brainchild of Andy Niedecker, who said, personal commitment, I will give an award once a year through Basel Peace Office, running youth initiatives, uh, and with his own personal money, has been putting that forward. That then got the, so the first year was one award. Then the Basel Start Canton got excited about it because they saw the quality of these youth projects that were coming forward. And they said, well, let's bring in another one. So the second year, we had two awards, and that's the same with the third year. And now this year is the first time we have a third award, thanks to the Evangelical Reform Church, which Professor Kunda here is the head of in Bali Start. So we have three youth awards now, and tomorrow is where you can meet the finalists. Uh, we had 80 youth projects from around the world nominated. We had a jury sort of selected down to nine, uh, and then tomorrow, from 4.30 till 6, we'll have the Pacey Awards ceremony. Uh, and you can register just by going to Basel Peace Office. That's the website, baselpeaceoffice.org. There we will have the nine projects that we presented. They'll have about five or six minutes to present their projects. We'll also hear from two previous winners from the World Youth for Climate Justice. Uh, and these are youth who said, this important issue of climate needs to go to the top court in the world, which is the International Court of Justice. Um, so they started a campaign and now it's moving ahead. There's a UN General Assembly resolution now with 16 countries have picked up this project and have put the resolution to the UN General Assembly. So expect it will be in court this year. So success from that one. And the other one that we're hearing from tomorrow also, which is really important in the current context, is the Youth Ambassadors for a Right to Peace. Uh, and we're seeing that right is eroded, it's been violated, but it exists. It's in international law, and it's really important to elevate that um, and to indicate you know, that it's not just make love, not war, but it's, we have a right to love, not war. We have a right to peace, which is really important. And we need to stand up for those rights. Um, and yeah, the youth ambassadors were right to peace of doing that. So we'll hear from those tomorrow on the event. It's online. We hope that you can join us. And with that, I want to thank all the panelists. It was wonderful to have a wonderful mix. We've got religious leaders, we've got parliamentarians, we had a mayor, uh, we've got also youth, and as Vana said, youth who are experts in their field as well. Uh, and that's important to recognize that there is expertise amongst youth and there are a range of different activities, uh, projects, perspectives. It's not just one youth voice. And that's what I hope that we demonstrate through this intergenerational process. Thank you so much for joining us and, and participating in us, and we look forward to seeing you again in other interdisciplinary projects. Before you all leave, Evan, please. Before you all leave, 
let me symbolize the interaction between parliaments or former parliamentarians and Alan, the director of NGOs. Uh, this guy called Warming Strike Practice. Uh, you see, I wear the corresponding shawl. This was given to the Swiss parliamentarians in 2019, my last year of mandate. This is the men's tie. So the Swiss male MPs received this in 2019. And I had one uh, piece of this left in my library. And I found Alan deserves this tie. Most appropriate. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs>